Welcome to today's webinar in the Cadigo Symptom-Based Complications and Dialysis webinar series. Today's episode is episode one, Appropriate Symptom Assessment in Dialysis Patients. Our presentations will be followed by a questions and answer session. Participants have submitted questions in the pre-registration process, and we will be taking questions during the presentation, so please ask your questions early and often. We will cover as many questions as time allows. Our speakers today for episode one are Professor James Burton, MD, University of Leicester, United Kingdom, and Professor Stephen Fishbane, MD, Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra, Northwell Health, United States of America. It is my pleasure to turn the webinar over to Professor Burton. Go ahead, sir. Hello everyone, uh, my name's James Burton. I'm a consultant nephrologist in Leicester in the UK and professor of renal medicine at the University of Leicester. It's an absolute pri privilege and pleasure to have been invited to talk about the management of symptom burden in dialysis patients and to be part of this KDGO uh, controversies conference on symptom management uh, in, in people on dialysis. These are the short list of relevant disclosures from myself and Dr. Fishbane. And what we're going to do is, is to move straight into the, into the talk and think about the severity of, of symptoms uh, of advanced chronic kidney disease. And there's quite a lot of information on this slide. And, and so what I'm going to do is just draw out the most pertinent points from it. And, and the first one is, is there highlighted in red. That's essentially what all of this is about. And that is that, that people with CKD have on average between 6 and 20 symptoms associated with their disease and comorbidities. And so it doesn't take much to, to really appreciate the burden that those symptoms have on quality of life and activities of daily living. And as we'll talk about as we go through through this talk and, and other talks in the series, uh, that those symptoms can be very broad, they can overlap, um, they can be associated with those other comorbidities, but they have a significant impact on, on individuals' quality of life. And they get worse, unsurprisingly, as, as CKD uh, gets worse. And you can see there from, from that, that graphic with the arrow um, that hemodialysis patients are particularly burdened by symptoms over and above other forms of renal replacement therapy like PD, that as kidney function gets worse, then there is a, a steeper increase in the number of symptoms that people will experience and the intensity of them, and that the worse it gets, obviously, the higher the, um, the level of distress that that causes to the patients that we look after. And on the right hand side there, we, we can think about the severity, the intrusiveness of those symptoms. And we're going to talk about some of those in more detail as we as we go through as we go through the talk, but it, it's worth just, if you're looking at some of those symptoms that are there with the severity, you might be reflecting on how much you thought that they impacted upon the people that you look after. And we're gonna be talking about that as we go through as well. So there, there are many publications around, around symptomatology in, in advanced chronic kidney disease. I've just picked out one here. This is a cross-sectional survey of, of 66 patients with, with CKD stage 5 that are managed conservatively in three centres in the UK. Um, and symptoms were assessed using um, a particular validated uh, symptom score that does focus on, on renal symptoms. And the reason that I've picked this out, and we're going we're gonna to talk about priority of, of symptoms for, for patients and people with kidney disease as we go through. But, but I think this study demonstrates really nicely that conservatively managed patients with stage five CKD 
the, the kind of prevalence of some of the, the symptoms that, that you can see here. And as we move through, again, we'll be talking about some of these symptoms individually in more detail, but, but you can see here 75% of patients report a lack of energy and fatigue uh, and pruritus. And then as we go down again, I'm just inviting you to think about whether those symptoms on the list uh, would, would be of concern or a priority for you when, when you're seeing individuals on your units. Uh, and we're going to come back to that in, in a little bit, bit more detail as we go through. So this next slide highlights that that difference between frequency of symptoms and burden of symptoms. And I often talk to, to individuals that I see about the intrusiveness of, of symptoms. Um, and again, you can just see you can see just how frequent some of those symptoms, for example, of, of lethargy, feeling tired, dry skin, and pruritus, just how prevalent they are. Um, the majority, a vast majority of people will, will, will feel a, a number of those symptoms. And that, as you can see, contributes to an increased burden and a decrease in health-related quality of life. And just talking about those things with healthcare professionals, uh, we know uh, is reassuring, insightful and valuable for patients. So how does dialysis impact on, on that, that symptom burden on those symptoms of CKD? We talked a little bit about non-dialysis, stage five CKD, but what happens to the burden of symptoms once people start dialysis? And I don't know about you, but you know I sit in low clearance clinics and I, I help to look after people on the dialysis unit. And for an awful lot of individuals, once they've started dialysis, it, it doesn't necessarily meet up to the expectations uh, that they had uh, when they were in low clearance clinic. And so thinking about lethargy, for example, you can see here one year after dialysis initiation, only 25% or 24% of patients in that particular study actually reported improvements in, in their symptoms of fatigue. And actually a number of people reported worsening of those symptoms. And again, we're not gonna go through all of the points on this slide, that's there for you to look at later on and perhaps read through now, but, but I think picking out some of the important points is that the expectations of individuals once they start dialysis are not always met. Some symptoms like pruritus can, can potentially get worse. And some of the other ones that you can see there around sleep, uh, and pain, often the reality of what happens after dialysis initiation does not necessarily meet up with the expectations of patients. And so this next slide is, is around the concept of alignment. And I remember once somebody said to me, you, you know, that as physicians, we often think that the most important concept or, or issue for, for our, the people that we look after on dialysis might be around transplantation. But actually, certainly here in the UK, if you, if you survey people, the biggest concern for individuals on dialysis is more around transport. And so those alignment of priorities can actually be, be very, very different. I couldn't find a, a reference for that, but I'm, I'm sure that's absolutely right. And here you can see that definition of alignment is an agreement between a group of countries, political parties, or people who want to work together because of shared interests or aims. And we just have to think about whether that alignment is close or far apart, and what are the factors that might contribute to that. And here's a, a study from the American Journal of Kidney Diseases, looking at the identification and prioritization of quality indicators for conservative kidney management. And again, this is quite a busy slide, but I, I use this to illustrate that concept of alignment. And so what you can see here is I've highlighted the top 10 um, issues from patients and caregivers. And, and you can see that they're ranked there from numbers one to 10. It doesn't necessarily matter what those are, but what I want to show you is, is here the top 10 from healthcare professionals. You can see that actually the number one 
priority from patients and caregivers was ranked number nine by healthcare professionals. And none of the other items in the top 10 from patients and caregivers made the healthcare professional list at all. And the number one issue for healthcare professionals was actually number uh, 38 on, on the list from patients and caregivers. So I, I use that to just highlight that often the, uh, the concept, the priorities of, of, from healthcare professionals and those of, of, um, of patients and caregivers do not align. I am certain that we are all very familiar with the, uh, with the SONG program, the standard outcomes in nephrology programs, specifically around hemodialysis. Um, which was a Delphi survey process of almost two, uh, just over a thousand participants from, from 73 high income countries that developed this core outcome set for hemodialysis research. And uh, I, want, I want to just highlight one particular symptom around itch, I, again, because it, I think that is a subject that highlights really uh, well, the discrepancy between what is going on in terms of patient outcomes and what we think of as healthcare professionals. Um, I'm going to come back to that. Um, because in terms of itch, if we think about the prevalence of itch and how common it actually is, and you can see that here 69% of nephrologists participating in the DOP survey underestimated the prevalence of itch in their dialysis facility. And a couple of the things to highlight from these bar graphs is that when you, you look amongst the patients who were bothered by itchy skin, 25% of those individuals didn't report that symptom to anybody. And amongst those patients who were nearly always or always bothered by itch, where that intrusiveness rating was much higher, 1,000 patients, 17% of those similarly didn't report that symptom to anybody at all. And this next slide is, is again, it's just want to pick out a couple of things from here. And, and this is around alignment. And the first thing is that actually, when you look at the number of facilities here, uh, the actual incidence of itch is, is high in the majority of facilities and that the alignment of what a nephrologist's estimate is of that symptom in their units is much lower than the patients would report. And what you can see here is in all of those facilities, a nephrologist's estimate of severe pruritus was less than 5%, and that in the majority patients were reporting it, the incidence was considerably higher than that. So when we move back to, to that diagram from the SONG program, al although itch is just one symptom, we can see how that impacts upon many other quality of life metrics that are really important to individuals. We know that itch causes anxiety and stress, problems with sleep, low mood, uh, ability to work um, and uh, function socially, it, it's associated with pain and significantly associated with fatigue, which is consistently the most important measure for, uh, for people on dialysis. So I just want to talk a little bit about how we measure and how we, we, we quantify those symptoms. And Dr. Fishbane is going to be talking a little bit more about that later on. So I'm not, I'm only going to touch on that in a, in a small amount of detail, but you can see here the SONG tool for estimating uh, the impact of fatigue. It's easy, it's short, and there's got to be a balance with what we do between overburdening individuals with lots and lots of, of tools to, to measure reported outcomes um, versus the, the information that we need to get in order to think about our management. Um, and this, this next slide actually is, is what I really wanted to highlight from that, from that, um, from that work. And that is, and I've, I've just bolded those out here, that the, the work from the SONG initiative reminds us, we cannot assume we know what matters to our patients. We must ask them and then listen closely. 
And we can't intervene upon that which we do not recognize as a problem. Okay, so what effect then do these symptoms of advanced CKD have on patients' lives? What, what's the impact of that burden and that, um, that intrusive nature? Again, I'm just going to pick out a few points here. Sleep is really important. And again, it impacts on a number of those uh, other things that are important, like uh, tiredness and fatigue. Itch is important, pain, all of those things that we saw within this, the song diagram that perhaps we think about on our units less than we ought to. And if we we look at the executive summary of a, a previous KDGO controversies conference on supportive care in chronic kidney disease and the roadmap that was highlighted there to improving the quality of care. And again, this is a very busy slide, the next one, but what I want to highlight from this is that when you, you think about things on that roadmap, the symptoms that we need to be concentrating on and thinking about, and I've highlighted some of them there, particularly because you can see that there's actually no clear management pathways for how we would deal with those issues that are important to patients. And how we address that is, is another question really. But the recommendations from that working group was to think about global symptom screening using validated tools that should be incorporated into our routine clinical practice. Um, a stepwise approach, thinking about non-pharmacological interventions and then pharmacological therapy that may have efficacy across a number of different symptoms given that overlap that we've talked about earlier. Um, and that symptom management really ought to be a priority in research and in clinical practice. So just to summarize so far before we hand over to, to Dr. Fishbein. So we know that people with dialysis dependent to chronic kidney disease suffer from a multitude of overlapping intrusive symptoms, often underrecognized and underreported, but with a significant impact on quality of life. Um, our priorities are often not aligned with the priorities of, of the people that we look after. And once we identify symptoms, there's often no clear pathways or guidelines to guide our management. So thanks very much to listening for that bit. And I'm going to hand over to Dr. Fishbane for the next part of the talk. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, to Dr. Burton. I'm Steve Fishbane, uh, Chief of Nephrology at Northwell Health in New York. Uh, great pleasure to be able to be part of this KDGO activity. I'm going to be now taking the next step in terms of thinking about the types of issues and symptoms that Dr. Burton discussed and how do we bring that into assessment, uh, both in the office and in dialysis as well. So first, look, you know, I think we have to accept the fact that in dialysis in particular, patients have a great deal of comorbidity. And as a result of that, there's a lot of focus on medical issues. And as I go through my dialysis unit, um, I, in some patients, am having to prioritize uh, immediate issues. Yesterday in my unit, I had a patient with calciphylaxis and a lot of the issues there were medical and managing issues related to infection, for example. But at the same time, you know, I think the question becomes in patients that have a lot of comorbidity and medical illness, how do we bring in um, programs where we systematically are able to give proper attention to patients' symptoms, priorities, and needs? And really, that's what this is all about because um, it's so critically important that we understand patients' self-reported, what is important to them it's different for different people. And that makes it a little bit more complex. And how do we manage medical issues as a team of care providers and do it in a way that's systematic? 
So we have to, you know, accept that uh, what Dr. Burton presented to us was a very stark recognition of the fact that the overall quality of patient's experience is affected by more than the fact that they have kidney disease or that they go for dialysis treatments perhaps three times a week if you're a hemodialysis patient. But you saw the list of symptoms uh, and he spoke about fatigue, paritis, pain, anxiety. Um, there's so much that patients are experiencing. And if we become too focused, on adequacy of dialysis or anemia or lowering the phosphorus concentration. And we've got to do all of those things and forget the fact that the patient's life is primarily being affected by fatigue or by pruritus, which is keeping them from sleeping at night. We're really failing right in our primary job as healthcare providers. So the question really is how do we improve on in our systems, not just physicians, but all providers that are touching patients, improving uh, bringing patients' symptoms and experience into our care programs. On the next slide, I'd like to repeat back to the KDGO identification. This was such a nice publication in 2015 from their conference on symptoms. And here looking at supportive care, and Davis and a colleague speak about that identification of patients most likely to benefit, for example, from supportive care, uh, an approach to system assessment and management, communication of prognosis. And we've been really interested in this. And this is true for people in the office that we care for with kidney disease and speaking to them about the progress of their disease, but it also applies to dialysis and making sure that patients have an understanding of how we're looking at the patient in terms of likely prognosis over time. And it's only when we share uh, together that knowledge and we reach kind of an understanding, are we able to have the context, the context that we need to be able to understand the importance of various things. If we've agreed with a patient that the prognosis is less than six months, you know, maybe yelling at the patient about the number of phosphate binders that they're taking isn't the most important factor, right? Um, sheer decision-making, to advance goal concordant care, so important that we are sharing in this process and that's not just the doctor and the patient, there's key caregivers that are so involved with patients' lives often. Um, and then we have the other caregivers, the healthcare providers that are part of our teams. Uh, and this is, I think what dialysis uh, care is so great at is, having a multidisciplinary group that can work together. And then the effective use of palliative treatments and where required hospice resources. So from there, I'd like to move towards an article from Gelfand et al, where they looked at supportive care and they broke it into different categories. So the areas of symptom management expert communication, and I love this part of it because I think that communication, and again, they come back here to prognosis and shared decision-making. The interdisciplinary team support. So here, you know, I would focus nephrologist, nurse, dietitian, social workers, and they bring in here a palliative care specialist, which in cases may be required a chaplain when appropriate. The option of comprehensive conservative care and approaching that for appropriate patients. Uh, we spend a lot of time in our uh, program approaching comprehensive conservative care. And the adjective here, the comprehensive word, I think is really the key because you may reach a decision with a patient with chronic kidney disease that the goal is not gonna be to go to dialysis that by itself 
really doesn't go very far because as the patient advances to lower levels of GFR, they're approaching what would ordinarily be a plan for dialysis. Um, simply having decided on the fact that conservative care is going to be the goal doesn't get you very far. What you end up with, which is a lot of people that panic at the last moment, end up in hospital um, with a catheter in their neck starting hemodialysis. That is where the comprehensive part of this comes into place. It's managing expectations over time in chronic kidney disease so that the patient understands how things will be developing and then working with the family so that you don't have a sister, a daughter, a son that shows up as the patient um, reaches the need to dialysis and say, oh, oh no, you know, we've got to do dialysis for this patient. Um, we need to be working with the family and make sure that expectations are understood so that we're able to truly move to what is comprehensive conservative care. And they speak here to end of life care, which of course is so important. And uh, at least in the States, you know, it's not necessarily what we're best at, but I think we're getting to be a lot better. In the next slide, sticking with the various uh, areas for supportive care, again, this is from the Gelfand American Journal of Kidney Disease paper, um, intensive uh, physical symptom management. So now as we focus a little bit more towards symptoms, it's that attention to symptoms, but with the non-physical dimensions of suffering to patient-centered explorations of prognosis. So you notice the term used here is patient-centered, that you know it's not us, uh, the nephrologist perhaps, who comes up with a prognosis and maybe tells our care team, but rather that we share this and evolve, evolve this as time passes, because prognosis, of course, is not static. I mean, if we know the day that we're speaking, what the prognosis is, um, that's great, but it's gonna change and we need to be good at that. And then eliciting patient preferences, conservative non-dialytic care when appropriate. And here, look, you know, I wanna be realistic. So, and I wanna be practical because I think sometimes when caregivers, when physicians, when other members of the care team look at um, this type of information, they start to think to themselves, wow, you know, I am so busy already managing diabetes, the complications of dialysis, the access that doesn't work well, the adequacy that is so hard to achieve, phosphorus, you know, how do we really get into um, over time eliciting patient preferences and symptoms and understanding them well? And I think we're gonna agree here that it's really gonna take a team of individuals in most well-developed programs to be able to do this because everybody is busy. And if we're gonna succeed in better um, working with patients and their caregivers to address symptoms, preferences, and be able to manage that effectively over time and systematically over time, you know, it certainly involves a multidisciplinary team working well together. In the next slide, I'd like to simply introduce a term to you, which you may be familiar with, but it's this concept which is so related to what we're talking about of life participation. And it's a wonderfully self-explanatory uh, term, but it gets to the idea of how much a patient is really able to be participatory in their life. Somebody at the end stage of life uh, who is in a chair managing pain throughout the day is not going to be fully engaged. But you know, for our patients, you know, this often means things like how fully engaged with your family are you able to be? Are you able to return to work? Um, you know, wonderful when that can be achieved. In the community, you know, what type of activities is the patient able to be involved with? Uh, 
perhaps travel, you know, for many of my patients, travel is an important part of their life as it is for, of course, many of us. Um, to what extent are they still able to participate and be part of that? And then there's friends, there's hobbies, religious affiliation, the richness of life, there's so much to it. But, um, you know, I'd like you to ask yourself at this point, you know, you may know your patient's KTRV really well, but you know, how much do you understand about your patient's ability to participate within their life? And this is such a great part of discussion and carving out the time and the ability to speak to patients. Um, so you can do this informally. This is common sense. This is talking to patients. There's also certainly tools that are available um, maybe not tools that are directly involved with life participation per se, but you'll see with the tools that I have listed here that they're kind of broader measures. And perhaps at some point we'll be looking at more specific life participation assessment tools, because I think there's real potential there. So incorporating patients' expectations on the next slide in general, um, how do we really achieve this? Gelfond notes that patients underreport symptoms unless asked explicitly about them. We saw Dr. Burton's discussion about how patients underreport symptoms. Um, so this is something that has to occur on a regular basis and you know, look, it just doesn't get accomplished by running through a dialysis unit and saying, how are you doing? Um, there needs to be some directed questions. So look, this can be accomplished, I think, informally, but in addition, there is a number of places where using validated tools is felt to be a more effective way to accomplish this. And uh, I don't want to say that it has to be done in that way, because I think there's different ways to accomplish this. Scaling to a patient's ability and desire. So, you know, being able to use different approaches for different patients, um, and that's important. Absolutely involving caregivers. So having programs where on a regular basis, you are to the extent that the patient is willing and wants to involving their caregivers. Communicating among the team, this may be the most important thing that's here. Again, for the physicians, nephrologists who um, are themselves very overburdened these days, being able to have a team available to support the efforts to elicit symptoms and understand them. And then, and then having a plan of care that we discuss that is not just KT over V phosphorus anemia, but includes patients' expectations, symptoms, and priorities. Um, it's really interesting. You know, I think uh, a lot of this work uh, has been done outside of the US at the time that I'm speaking uh, in Australia, the UK, and Canada. Uh, the authors here speak about who should own the process. Should it be the physician? Should it be a nurse? Should there be somebody specifically designated that we don't yet have, for example, in dialysis facilities in the United States that has a greater role here? Is it social workers? You know, interesting to consider. Now, um, as we think about tools so that although we can work with symptoms, priorities, prognosis in a way that is informal and by speaking to patients using common sense, absolutely in the research area, we need to have tools available that we're using. And I think a number of people would say that in many environments, um, you're simply going to be able to be more effective in actual clinical care if you have tools that are available. And these are examples of some of the tools that are out there. And I'll give you, um, you know, a little bit of an understanding of how this works. So this is data from Morton et al. And they looked at on the left-hand side, reasons for collecting or not collecting patient reported outcome measures, for example. And, you know, some of what was important for them here for collecting was to directly inform clinical care so that you were able to incorporate symptoms, 58% noted this, uh, 
health service mandates collection, research purposes, auditing, clinical practice, bottom right reasons for not collecting, insufficient staff time. We must be sensitive to that fact that if we don't address physician and staff time, then we're just talking conceptually in this entire presentation. If we're able to be able to address that issue and create teams and have available individuals to support the efforts here, that was 79% that answered reasons for not collecting information. This is data on the next slide, again from Wharton, on who actually is involved in obtaining the measures. So patients in over 70%, carer assisted in 60% of the time, nurse assisted 70%. So if you're using patient reported outcome measures and tools, um, it may be the patient, it may be the patient working with uh, carers, uh, with nurses. I like it better when there is a healthcare provider involved. So in summary, um, the quality of life for patients, the symptoms that they experience all play into the richness of the experience of life. And as we understand satisfaction, quality of life, life participation, we are missing in a big way if we're not uh, to a great extent bringing these issues into the routine care of patients. Patient reported outcomes, increasingly I think we're gonna see nephrology moving to understanding that rather than just extending life, that uh, working towards the quality of life experience is so critically important to truly achieving meaningful outcomes um, and life experience for patients. And then we get to the clinical practice versus research as we assess symptoms, participation in life. Uh, and this all goes to quality of care how much of it in your environment can be informal versus using survey tools that may help you. How are quality of life and patient satisfaction tools utilized in renal units? Should they be used to a greater extent? Dialysis, um, developing agreed upon use of survey tools. The word mandated here may not um, have meaning in a number of settings, but tools that are not just thrown out there for patients, reported at meetings and not really discussed in any substantive depth. We don't need to be wasting time. If we're using tools, we should be using them and they should be part systematically of our care plans. And then distilling the information in a way that it becomes part of routine patient care, symptoms, prognosis, expectations. Thank you for your attention, and we'll be very happy now to get into questions and answers. Thank you very much, Dr. Fishbane. Now we'll move into the questions and answer period. And I'll turn things over to Dr. Burton. Thanks very much to Dr. Fishbane. Um, and we're going to move into a question and answer session now. We've got um, some questions that have come through posed by you. Thank you very much for that. Um, but I'm gonna start with the, the first question to you, Steve, if that's all right. And, and you, you talked a little bit about the impact of, of this on staff time um, and, and how much that plays on the minds of, of staff and patients, actually, the burden they think that they're placing on staff with all of this. So how do you think we can evaluate that? How can we, how can we um, think about the impact that we're going to have by addressing that properly in an era where funding is important, business cases for new staff, extra resources is so very important? Yeah, James, thanks. You know, that's such a good question. And, um, you know, the first thing I guess that we need to acknowledge is that um, there is such a difference among all the different care settings in different countries. There's places where this is already well-developed and 
the ability to do this is built in and plug and play in terms of unit resources. And I'll say, you know, we have a network of about 15 dialysis units, but I think it's typical for most centers in the US. The doctor is very busy, the nurses, social workers, dietitians. There's a lot for us to do with just standard medical problems for patients and a lot of the indicators of dialysis care and ensuring that they work well. I think that everybody is very well intended right now on making sure that they try to understand patient symptoms and expectations. But, uh, you know, it's my sense, at least in US dialysis facilities, that to really do this in an effective, comprehensive, systematic way so that it's part of our quality program, so that it's part of our um, worked in care management of individual patients, that it needs to be more systematic. And um, it almost strikes me that we would need additional resources to really be able to do it well, because I'm not sure that we have the people there right now that we need um, to be able to accomplish it. And, you know, I, I guess it raises questions, doesn't it, in terms of you know, whether one, you could take the existing care model and build in, in an effective way, the ability to elicit symptoms and manage uh, symptoms, prognosis and expectations over time uh, versus a business case for um, additional resources, additional people that might be necessary to do this effectively. And uh, James, I'm wondering if you have thoughts in terms of you know, it's so difficult, all aspects of business cases and economic modeling. Um, do you have any thoughts in terms of how that might apply to something like this? Well, one of the things that you said, um, which really hit a note with me was around, you, you know, which staff resources would you potentially use to, to maximize on, on this? Um, and within the multi-professional team, you particularly mentioned social workers. Um, as as a as a as a group of people who might be you know skilled and and really suited to to thinking about some of these issues that we talked about, um, as well as the others, physiotherapy and, and dietetics. And we don't have a, a a social worker within our network that that specifically deals with with people on our dialysis units, but I think universally you ask any of the healthcare professionals within our multi-professional team, whether that would be useful or not, the answer would universally be yes. And so, you know, the model with, with which we work, um, we, we, we evaluate our patient satisfaction and, and we do the best we can within the constraints that we have. But I think we would all acknowledge that there are things that we can do better, whether that is, in the way that we assess things or the resources that we have uh, to, to make things better. I, I think, you know, having having that sort of element to the multi-professional team would make a big, a big difference. Otherwise, what we need to do is probably use the resources that we have more efficiently. And I think there's definitely ways that we could we could do that because it is becoming harder and harder to, to get additional resources without some data to show that that would be cost effective and with some of the things that you mentioned around life participation I think it's much harder the data out there is much less you know I fear that uh, for some of my colleagues in nephrology in the U.S. they will look at this type of presentation and they're going to feel so strongly that this is important that uh, they want so much to be able to do this for patients and to be able to effectively have programs of care where they can bring symptoms, expectation, prognosis, and palliation into uh, patient management. And at the same time, feel a frustration of yeah, how do we build resources to be able to do this? So I think it's an important unanswered question perhaps for now, uh, but I agree with you. You know, I think social workers are uniquely situated to help um, perhaps fire up the process and get it to work. Um, 
You know, I wonder in your presentation, I was struck by symptoms and the fact that um, you noted a couple of things. One of them was that patients uh, will have a tendency to underreport symptoms. And of course, it's different from patient to patient, but also the information on medical directors and physicians and a lack of awareness, perhaps, of some of the symptoms. And I, what do you think goes into that, James, in terms of why that doesn't just naturally flow to the surface? I guess a lot of that is is around workload, and you know we we naturally concentrate and put our minds to the the things perhaps like anemia and phosphate management you mentioned, and so perhaps we are less focused on asking patients actively about those symptoms that were on that list, whether that's because um we're less aware of how important they are to patients i think there's been an awful lot of work done to try and raise the awareness of that lack of alignment between what we might think is important to patients versus the things that they are uh they are actually experiencing so i think there's that sort of educational gap for us as as healthcare pr practitioners um i think there is uh, a, a worry from patients that they are burdening us, but also certainly in the UK and, and some of the, the, the research that I've been involved in here in the UK around, around symptoms and specifically around itch, it is symptoms like that seem to fall between specialties. And so someone might see their primary care physician and talk about itch, for example, and say, well, you know, that's, there's nothing we can really do about that. That's, that's just part of life. Um, they might not appreciate that it's associated with their kidney disease. So it depends who you report it to as to the, the answer that you might get back. Um, similarly, if you report that to a nephrologist, there may or may not be an awareness of how much that is uh, affected and impacted by the uremic state and by their CKD. And I think there's those that conflicting message perhaps between specialties is why a, a large proportion of patients from for the purposes of itch don't report that symptom to anybody at all. Um, and less than half of those individuals would, would report it to their nephrologist. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a, a kind of, I, I just wonder if, if patients really understand where they can be reporting it to, you know, who do you report fatigue to if you're not sure which part of your, your illness spectrum is contributing to that or breathlessness, for example, do you report breathlessness to your primary care physician or your kidney doctor or your cardiologist? And, uh, you know, how do we address that? How do we get around that? Um, and I think probably the truth is that as nephrologists, we see those individuals most often um, and they're most likely to report it to us. Uh, and I think it's our responsibility really to, to, like you say, have a much more systematic way of and proactive way of asking individuals about their symptoms, um, reassuring them that you know, you, we're listening to them, we're actively listening to them, and, and then, you know, do our best to feed that into a multi-professional team where we address those, the, those symptoms through management pathways. Um, and we can talk about management pathways, perhaps a little bit of questions come up about that. But, but I think there's, you know, it's a very complex issue around why patients do or, or don't report symptoms to us. And I think the complexity around that and the lack of clarity means that often people might just sit on them and report them to nobody at all. You know, I, I guess uh, I mean, that's so interesting. I, I was first struck by this probably about 15 years ago when a fellow came to me and wanted to study vitamin D in the treatment of uremic pruritus. And I very mistakenly said to him that I don't really think this is much of an issue. And I round on my patients and I take, I believe, very good care of my patients. And we then went around and more specifically 
asked patients through the entire dialysis facility that we were at at the time about itch and how it affects them. And I very quickly realized something which, you know, I think affected my practice generally um, going forward, which was that a lot of patients do suffer with itch, with pruritus, and that their experience of it, perhaps, you know, I had underplayed a bit, you know, I think of the occasional mosquito bite and okay, there's going to be a little itching there. And, uh, but I realized that what our patients experience is really quite different, that it affects their life, sleeping, uh, skin quality. And, uh, you know, we started on a number of different studies of agents. Uh, very exciting. I think in the U S now diphalocaphalin is an agent that's been approved for treatment. So, I think that will probably focus us on the need to really talk to patients and ask them specifically about pruritus. But these other symptoms, you know, are just as important. I mean, pruritus, pain, sleeplessness, depression, anxiety, and, you know, there's different abilities, I guess, there to treat. I think we've been a little bit nihilistic about uh, pruritus because we really haven't had an effective treatment until now. So it's interesting you talk about sleep because similarly, I round with my patients and um, a friend of mine who's a, an anesthetist and a sleep specialist said, oh, what's the prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in your patients? And I said, oh, pretty low, really. And I'm sure it would be pretty low. And she said to me, well, I'm, I'm not sure that's true, actually, James. And again, I sort of then thought, well, I'm going to ask people about this. And I started referring people to the sleep clinic and every single individual that I referred to the sleep clinic who was having problems with, with lethargy and falling asleep during the day and terrible sleep, every single one ended up on, uh, on, a, on a CPAP machine. And I thought, well, that must mean not that I'm just 100% right in, in my diagnosis, but that I'm, if everybody I'm sending has got it, I must be missing loads. Um, and again, I think it wasn't until that systematic screening that I went around and actively asked and thought about it, that I started to really appreciate how common it was and referring people and getting the right treatment for them. Now, sleep size. So that's fascinating because I find particularly in the office, uh, sleep and back pain are two issues that I hear about the most. Um, I, you know, I feel comfortable there. Sleep's interesting because often it's the caregiver who may notice that there is snoring at night, but I, I guess that kind of goes into the subject of caregivers in general that I, in, I think the states were not necessarily systematized to bring caregivers into the discussion of overall care, uh, not to you know mention symptoms more specifically. Um, how is it for you? I mean, do you find that it's easier in your care settings to be able to get caregivers more involved uh, in discussions and um, developing expectations? No, I agree with you. I don't think we do do that r routinely. Perhaps I would say that we do for our low clearance clinics when we're going through that education around different kinds of renal replacement therapy and perhaps some of our renal community experts are, are visiting people. But I was kind of, I've, I've been doing some patient involvement work for research and um, on the virtual platform, we've been much more able to go into people's homes and, you know, relatives, caregivers, husbands, wives, families are, are sort of around and, and, and are drawn into it. And what really struck me was, when partners have been involved in that conversation, they've often described it as our dialysis, um, as opposed to his or her dialysis or their dialysis. Um, and I think probably that interaction between caregivers and partners and family uh, is, is under-recognized and not just for people on home therapies, but it's got a significant impact on, on people who come to in-center therapies. And so I think that's really honed my thoughts about how we don't engage in those conversations with caregivers, but that they're almost certainly very important. Relationships are really important. And we know that dialysis impacts upon relationships. Um, 
so I don't we I don't think we're any better at, at that in the UK. Um, it's certainly something to think about. I think it's really important. I don't know if you if you do anything active to draw people in at the stage where they're on an incentive therapy or whether that or whether similar to us, that's something that would be more of an aspiration at the moment. Yeah, I think yeah, the nature of the disease that we're treating and the prognosis that often goes along with it, it almost mandates that we do uh, better in terms of having caregivers more involved with our conversations and discussions. Um, you know, we have regular interdisciplinary um, meetings where we work hard to get the patient involved with discussions with the overall care team. And, you know, I'm just wondering, as I'm hearing you talk, I love the uh, anecdote you gave about it being our dialysis. And um, I think the same is true. Um, but, you know, I think this is one of the things that we're going to need to, you know, in all care settings in all countries be better at if we're going to succeed in terms of really being able to address the kinds of questions that we're talking about today. And, and there's so much that we can talk about. And we're probably, I think, about getting to the end of the time that we have available. Um, James, it's been so wonderful to be able to speak with you today about this subject. There's a lot of questions and a lot of work yet to be done, isn't there? Absolutely. And likewise, what a what a pleasure to be talking to you, Steve. It's been a, a real honor. Thank you very much. On behalf of the audience, I'd like to thank you both very much for today's presentation and the handling of the questions and answers. This webinar was supported by an unrestricted educational grant from V4 Pharma. We'd like to thank our audience for joining us today. At this time, we will end the webinar and you may now disconnect.